Good morning. That's lovely to hear you all so quiet. So the, um, the countdown works, John. That's a good idea. Were you watching the, um, the notices as they came up there? It'd be lovely if you are. Um, okay, so this week we've got Sylvia and Dave preaching. And the children will be entertained during the service, when they, Sylvia? <laughs> changed your mind. So. <laughs> okay, so it's, um, it's light and deep service. Next week we have our regional minister preaching and leading the service. That's Gail Richards. So it'd be lovely to see lots of us there, here, then. The only activity that I know of that's on this week is the coffee morning. Yep. So that's at 10.30 on Wednesday, and you're welcome to come along to that. House groups, just speak to your leaders to find out whether you're meeting this week or not. We have the three sign-up sheets in the entrance. Please make sure you sign up. And for the barbecue, we're still desperate for a chef. If we don't get one, we might be having raw meat. <laughs> not nice. So please, if you can barbecue, please let us know. And I think that's everything. Oh, David, do you want to speak, David? And Colin, you can, yeah, speak yourself. Make, make myself more audible. Very good. Um, just reminding everyone um, about the uh, music uh, evening that will or possibly daytime that we'll be having on 24th of September. More details will be following. Assuming nothing funny happens with technology, the, there'll be some proper propaganda coming out over the next little while, some samples, you can hear what's happening, etc. But for the moment, date, date in the diaries, 24th September, a um, bunch of good worship music, some of which you won't have heard before, um, played by um, a band, one of whom you will recognize. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's just a quick plea for help if, if anyone's around. Next Saturday morning, from 10 o'clock onwards, I'm going to go over here taking down the last of the bushes around by the kitchen, ready for the uh, building work that we're going to have started out there. So if anyone's around and fancies giving me a hand for an hour or two, that would be great. It'd be just great cutting down the tree and generally tidying up and getting rid of the rubbish that's around the back there. So any help, greatly appreciated. 10 o'clock. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Colin. Just to say as well that coffee will be served outside today so we can enjoy the sunshine and we can have a look at the cards that the Cottenden ladies have been making for us for fundraising. Are there any birthdays? Brenda, come on in. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, let's sing to Brenda. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brenda. Happy birthday to you. We're in the presence of God. Do we accept that each time? And uh, as some of you know, this place, this place was opened in 1856 and there was a, a church in the High Street, a uh, Baptist church there before then. And as we know, we can date the church itself back for so many hundreds of years. Why? For the worship of God. Because our God is great, because people want to bow down before him and to worship him. So we've come to praise him to hear from him, I hope, to pray to him. I don't know how many listened to the morning service on the radio this morning. If you did, you will have heard, amongst other things, the Lord's Prayer being said in, I don't know how many languages, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we were told. But all the people who were, uh, this was recorded at the Lambeth Conference last week, I'm told, and all the people there from many different countries, different uh, voices, they all said the Lord's Prayer in their own language, which is 
interesting to hear. I've only ever heard it in, when I've been on holiday in France or something like that to, to hear it in a different language. I thought it would be good as we gather in the name of Jesus to pray as a start the prayer that Jesus himself taught his disciples. So let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. His indeed is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And we pray that his will will be done in this place and in us today. The psalmist said, uh, I think it's Psalm 96, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. And we're going to start that. If the uh, musicians would gather, we'll uh, start off by singing a lovely hymn, but it is calling us all to praise the name of the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Sure, the first words. I don't know this one. The terror of the first words. For We're going to sing graves in.
we were, I was working on the basis that this was a family service, which is lovely, but uh, we have a few young people with us, but only a few, and uh, it's lovely to see those who are here. Um, but I, I had a few questions for them, uh, and uh, I want also to come to just a time to pray together. We've already prayed the prayer that Jesus taught us, but we want to talk again to him. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. I wonder if you know, the young people, if you can answer this question. Who's the head of state? Who is the head of state? Who is the monarch? Come on, Keegan, you know that. Come on. Shout it out if you can. All right. And we're getting it from the back. The Queen. The Queen. And the Queen's name? Well, yes. Queen Elizabeth. Ah, oh, the second. Don't forget. Uh, she's the second. Anyone good enough doesn't just have to restrict it to the younger people. When did the first Queen Elizabeth reign? Anyone know that? Yeah, okay. you're getting within a century. Uh, that's quite good. Huh? Yeah, is that, is, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But very much the second half of the 15th. Very good. Quite right. 1558, she became queen. And you were quite right, and then she reigned until 1603. And I'm sure you can guess that I looked that up. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know it. One thing I didn't know, how old do you think Elizabeth I was when she became queen? Anyone know? How old was Elizabeth I when she became queen? Anyone? Can't, can't hear. She was 25. Now, why is that interesting, particularly? Because when did Queen Elizabeth II become queen? When she was 25. She wasn't crowned until she was 27. But in February, was it 6th six, of February, 2nd February, uh, 1952, she was still 25. So both Elizabeths became queen uh, when they were 25. That's just, by the way, just for your further information. Okay. All right, next, next question then. Where does the queen live? Well, sometimes. Where, where's her main residence? Buckingham Palace. That's what I'm after. Has anyone been there? Who's been to Buckingham Palace? Oh, there have been some. Very good. Very good. The reason I'm telling you all that is uh, I, I rang them up the other day. And uh, some of you know this story. I rang them up because we've been looking, as you, most of you know, uh, after the uh, elderly lady who was our neighbour. And uh, she's now living in the care home just up the road. And she was coming towards her 100th birthday, which was the 22nd of July, as it happens. And I thought, she is so desperate to get her card from the Queen, uh, I thought, I must make sure she's going to get it. So I looked online, in case you're interested in this sort of thing, I looked online and it said, you don't have to do anything. It's done. So I thought, ah, being as I am, I thought, belt and braces, I'll check it anyway. So I looked further online and it gave me a telephone number. And I, so I just dialed the number and it was just surreal to me anyway. I, so, hello, Buckingham Palace. And I thought, oh gracious, it didn't say it was Buckingham Palace, it just gave me a telephone number. So, I should have done, yeah. But I tell you, in retrospect, I thought that afterwards, when I try and ring my bank, I have to hang on half an hour, but I answered it straight away. Hello, Buckingham Palace. And so I thought, uh, so I explained who I was, and I said I was the attorney for this lady. And she said, who are you ringing about? So I said, well, her, her name is Mrs. Varney. 
And the lady on the other end of the line said, Oh, yes, Audrey Varney, yes, yes, I've got her here on my list. Um, and uh, she lives at 38 Heathfield. I said, well, actually, she's now in a care home. She said, oh, well, she's jolly good you rang. So I said, I'm ringing to check that you're going to send her a card. Oh, yes, it's all in hand. The card will get to, you on the day, or get to her on the day. I thought that was pretty good. But it was just a big surprise. Hello, Buckingham Palace. It was very, very strange. OK, next question. Where does God live? Yeah, shout it out. In heaven. We said that right in our first prayer, didn't we? Our Father who art in heaven. God's in heaven. Wouldn't it be lovely if when we said we're going to speak to God, we heard, hello, heaven here. And No, I'm being serious. It would just be, be wonderful, wouldn't it? But the Bible tells us that he is there and he is listening. And that lady to whom I spoke, I didn't speak to the Queen herself, I'm afraid, but I did speak to her, one of her helpers, and she, she was able to tell me all the things. She knew all about the lady I was speaking to, before I even mentioned. She knew the full name, she knew the date of birth, she knew the address. I didn't have to tell her uh, anything she, that she didn't already know. And prayer is a bit like that. We say, why do we pray sometimes? Because we say, doesn't God know anyway? And the answer we say is yes. But when you talk to your parents, when you talk to your friends, you often say things that they know already. They just want to hear you say it. They want to hear uh, your voice. And God wants that too. So we're just going to pray a, a simple prayer uh, to welcome him here today. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have access to you that it is more important than speaking to Buckingham Palace. It's more important than anything else because you, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, have made our access to you possible. And you're the listening ear. You hear us. You hear whatever we say. You go before us. You know things before we do, really. And we ask that you will bless us. Bless us, each one. We thank you for your love. We thank you for this day. We see the sunshine and we realize that every day is a gift from our God to us. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being all that you are. We may not be able to see you physically, but we can know you in our hearts and, and in our lives. And we thank you, Father, that that should be so. Please be with us, not just now, not just in this hour together, not just in the special day that we set aside for you, which we call Sunday, but for every day. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for what you are to us. Amen. And we used to sing a song, didn't we, when the youngsters uh, learned it at a holiday club some years ago. So we have sung it before fairly recently, but we'll sing it. And I wanted really to say to the youngsters that this is what it's all about. Prayer is like a telephone. So I pick up the phone and I speak to somebody and they hear me. You may not have to pick up your phone. A lot of people say, I pray in the car. Well, that's good. I do that too. But I promise you, I don't shut my eyes. I, I keep them open and uh, I pray to God. And that's, that's good. Let's sing. Prayer is like a telephone for us to talk to Jesus. We'll sing this through a couple of times. Okay.
Please be seated. Do we? We should do. It's good. It's good to use it every day. Right. Again, having prepared, as it were, uh, a talk for the children, that's all of us today. <laughs> so bear with me. That Keegan's going to come and help me in just a minute. I'll call you out in a minute. Yeah, come on then, Keegan. Come, come and stand beside me. Right. Who can drive a car? I'm looking at the youngsters at the back. Anyone drive a car? Do you fancy driving a car? Do you fancy... Yeah, I thought you would. Yeah, when I was your age, I used to look forward to driving a car. Who can ride a bike? You can do that, can't you? Yeah, you can do that. Good. Do you know the rules of the road? I'm talking to the adults here as well as the children. Do you know the rules of the road? <laughs> okay. He can hold that up. Okay. What does that say? Stop. The word's not there, is it? No. But we know, because we know the rules of the road, it means stop. You see that, can't you? I need to take it. <laughs> so I have to keep holding it up for a minute. I've got something else in a minute. Okay. But what about if you're in a hurry? What about if it's really important, you're late for a meeting? What about if I've got, I've got to be at school on time, or I've got to get to the doctors, or I've got to do this, that, and the other? I'm in such a hurry. What do we have to do? We have to stop. It doesn't matter that we're in that hurry. So why can't we do just what we want? We have to f obey the rule. How many of you, how many of the youngsters, I don't know, parents will be able to t tell me these days, are there, do you have lollipop ladies at the schools around here? You do have the, you do. Yeah, you do have lollipop ladies. Right, okay. What does it say on the uh, sticks? Do you know what it says on the stick? No. What does it say? It says, yeah, stop. It says, stop. And if you're crossing the road and the man or lady, so many of the ladies, hold up their stick and then others don't obey the stop sign, what's going to happen? In fact, we read about it only this last week in the newspaper, someone who didn't stop. I don't know if it was a lollipop lady, but people were cro pedestrians crossing and they didn't stop and they got really hurt. And some of you have probably been reading the paper, they, they're just changing the law because of that, because it's happening too often. And there's going to be a collision and someone is going to get hurt and someone, not you Keegan I'm sure, would get into trouble with the police. Did you know that they have the power to take your bike away if you don't stop and you get into a collision and the police get called, they not only can tell you off, they not only can punish you, they can take your bike as well. So be, be wary, be prepared. So why do we have rules? There are lots of rules of the road. Okay, you can put that one down there. So you can hold that one up for me. Now that one. So what's that? You can see that? Anyone read that? Okay, there's another one, the other hand. Okay, it's another version of it. Okay, the highway code. Who's got one? Not too many hands going up. Not too many hands. Okay. More importantly, who's read it? Oh, just the one or two. Okay, you can put them down, thanks. Okay. But they are the rules of the road. And so many of them we, we just follow because we think that's obvious. Drive on the left, thank heaven everyone follows that one. Unless you go to France or something, but uh, you know what I mean. Okay, stop at red lights. Are the rules there to spoil our fun? Or are they to make it better and safer for everyone? And the reason I say all that is that we've got another rule book here 
which I'm going to hold up, which is my Bible. And that's the rule book as well. Did you know that? I'm sure you did. Yeah. So that's, that's another way of finding out the rules. I want to ask who's got one, because I imagine every hand will go up if we've all got a Bible. And again, the question comes, have we read it? How much of it have we read? How much of it have we not read? Some of it's quite jolly difficult to read. Sylvia and I are reading the Bible in a year, and some of it is quite difficult. We've got to Chronicles, and those of you who know what I'm talking about will realise how difficult that is. Uh, we're going through that just at the moment. But it's the Word of God. It's a message to us from God. Lots of rules, lots of information. Tells us what we should do, but importantly, it tells us what we shouldn't do. But it's not to spoil our fun. It's actually to make things better. So I'm going to have a look at a few of the, the rules of the highway. Did you know that they've just changed the highway code? Many, many of you did. What? Oh, Martin's read the new one all the way through, Martin. That's pretty good. Most of the rules stay the same, but there are some differences. This one is the old one, which is why I've got that one, because that contains all the new ones. <laughs> all the, the new ones are in there. Okay, thanks, Keith. You do well. Okay, so let's just ha have a, a little look. Right, so, you want to hold that up for me? Right. What's that say? Yeah, it's yeah, it's because it's often put up near schools, children crossing. But where else do you see that? Can't hear you. It's on every lollipop stick. Stop! And then it's got this this picture. Keep it up. It's got that picture beneath. So the, lo the lollipop stick has it, and it's because of the children. Okay. But the good thing about that, and the reason I think that it fits in well with what I'm talking about, is that the person is there to help us, and the person of God is there to help us with all the rules and so on. So the lollipop lady may well be telling us to do things or not do things, but she's there to help us to get it right. Now, we're on a journey. Okay, we'll put that one down, shall we? We're on a journey. The question then is, are we following the signs? Okay, you can hold that one for me. There's a sign. Now, don't see too many of those on the road. Not quite like that. We see lots of junction signs. We see lots of things pointing to perhaps where we're aiming for and where we want to go. But this one is really only in the Bible. That's a turning, and it says to life because it shows us and tells us how we can find life and are we going in the right direction okay so we've got to check the rules there for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life John 3 16 I was talking to a friend the other day this is by the way and he was stopped in the street by someone. I won't bore you with the details. And they were saying, I want, we want to talk to you about Jesus. What is that? And my friend stopped and spoke to him. Uh, and uh, he didn't know. This person who was trying to tell others, including my friend, uh, about Jesus, he didn't know John 3.16. Because my, my friend said, yeah, well, something he said. And my friend said, well, what about John 3.16? And he said, well, what's that? So I think that raised into question some of the things he was trying to pass on. But the Bible points us in the right direction. Thank you, Keegan, that's lovely. But sometimes things are not quite so easy, are they? How many have seen that sign? Have you ever looked at the skid marks on that? Because it tells us, what does it tell us about the car? Yes. Tells us the car's turned around, it's pointing the other way. It's pointing back. A slippery, uh, sorry, yes, yeah, slippery road sign. It's, it has turned around, it's facing exactly the wrong way. And the Bible, again, gives us signs about that. Don't turn the wrong way. In fact, we've got a little verse there. I'm going to hold that one up for me. Going through these fairly quickly. There. The Lord says, 
I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. So the Bible tells us the way to life and the Bible warns us about the way to death if we don't follow the right sign. Okay, I put that one down. I wonder how many have seen this one. I think I saw it once. Someone didn't follow the right way and didn't see the sign. Did you see what that one was? Oh, you can. You can see it through the... <laughs> Thanks, Keegan. You're doing a great job. So that's, that's if we go really wrong. But we need the signs, and the signs are put up, and they are there. And you may come across them if you live near the coast or go on holiday to the coast. They're there. Don't go down that road because this could happen. Okay. So we want to get right from that. So let's move on. But if you're unsure and you're not sure which way to go, then it's like coming sometimes to this. Right. Hold that up. Crossroads. Like being at a crossroads, Jesus says, I want you to go the right way. That's the way to life. But you've got to decide. You've got to decide. You can turn, you come up here, you can turn that way or that way, or you can go that way. That's what you have to do when you're in a car and you come to the crossroads. I am the way, the truth and the life, says Jesus. Let's see. Is that that one? Here we are. We've got that already written down. Jesus says that he is the way. And that's the Bible telling us again. I am the way and the truth and the life. Most of us know that verse. Do we all know where it comes from? Doesn't matter really. John 14 verse 6. Just remember, it's a really important verse for us to know. Okay. But there is only the one way. Okay, Jesus didn't say life's going to be easy. Well, here we are. Here's, here's the one way. That's, we'll hold that up just because I've got it there. One way to go and stick to that. And the Bible tells us which way that is. Okay, we've got some more. What about that one? Jesus says, I'm afraid, says it in the Bible, Life's not always going to be nice and plain, smooth, newly tarmacked road or whatever. He says it's going to be a bit bumpy. And sometimes, if you get through the bumps all right, then you can get to somewhere else. This one. Try that one. Yeah. Okay. The road gets narrower. Okay. Can you keep, keep that in one hand and hold that in the other hand? Okay. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. So we've got the point in going the right direction to the life, but it's going to be a bit bumpy and it's going to get narrower. And the Bible itself says narrow is the road that leads there. Okay, you can put those down, thanks. And there's still some problems on the way. And again, it's all in the Bible, so we may have a a highway code to tell us what to do on the on the road but we've also got a, a code in the Bible to tell us how to live our lives but what about this one how many of you have seen this oh that can be a problem it's like that wasn't I was gonna say it's like the railway children it wasn't a road there was it that was the train track in the railway children where the, all the rocks fell down on the road well they do fall down on the road sometime we've been and seen that. Thankfully, we haven't been uh, caught by the rocks, but we have been to places where you couldn't get through because the rocks have fallen on the road. Okay. But, now this one may be good or bad, but I think the Bible tells us that it can be good. There is power. There is power above. That's an overhead electricity sign. I think it's telling us to beware of an overhead electricity sign, but it can be a jolly good thing, because we have things coming from overhead which help us. Who's got a sat-nav? Many have sat-navs now, we have. And uh, satellite navigation system. And so power comes down. Does your 
sat now speak to you? Mine does. Turn around when possible. You have gone the wrong way. No, I want to go this way. And she doesn't answer. I say, just turn around when possible. Well, the Bible says that. And sometimes we think, God, I need you to point me a be better because I'm going wrong. That's lovely. Okay. And there's one other thing particularly that our Bible says that if we're following what the, the road is towards life, if we've taken the correct turning, there's one more thing. Go on. Hold that one up. That way. Okay. Uh, no you... Hold it up high. No U-turns. Okay. And sometimes you see that on the road and it's very tempting sometimes to think, well, there's nothing coming. There's, uh, I can turn easily. But the road, is, uh, the sign is, no U-turns. Now you see, the rules of the road, some of them are just tips, good ideas, read, read your highway code, or ask Martin, he, he knows it all because he's read it all. <laughs> well, you, I, I commend you, Martin, I think that's terrific. <laughs> so, so some of them are just tips, some of them are warnings, but some of them are commands. That is a command. Red circle round. You do what it says. And the Bible has got bits like that. There are good tips in it. There are good signs as to what we should or shouldn't do. But there are also commands as to what we must do or what we must not do. So thank you, Keegan, very much. Thanks very much. So that's lovely. Okay, now before we move on to something, we're going to sing again, if the musicians would come, we're going to sing Cornerstone, and whilst this is being sung, uh, our offering will be received, please, those who are taking the offering. So let's again join, time we stood up, I think.
shall we just give thanks for the offering Father thank you for the gift of money we know that so much is given through the banking system and these gifts are now brought to you with our love but our love for you which is overwhelmed by your love for us Lord receive the gifts that we offer be they uh, in money terms or other terms be they in this bag, these bags, or be they through the banking system or whatever, Lord, receive all that we offer because we offer it with love to you for your love first to us. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Father, we thank you again. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that we can have confidence in your promise that when we gather in your name, you are there in the midst of us. Lord, you indwell us. We find it hard to understand how these things can be, and yet we have confidence that they are because you have promised them and your word tells us. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, this world is not as you would wish it to be. We know that there is so much going on that causes us distress, and if it causes us distress, how much more distress must it cause you? Lord, we thank you for this world that you have created and we apologize that it is not as you would wish it to be lord we are concerned for things worldwide we think concentrate in thinking about ukraine and all that is going on there the bloodshed the devastation the horrors of war lord we cannot fathom it in so many ways we can only ask that you will be there in the midst of it you will be there with the people who are suffering, with the people who are seeking to do what they believe is right in your name. Lord, be with them. Comfort them. Uphold them where, that is, so where, where your people are gathered there, Lord. Bless them as they reach out in the name of Jesus. And Lord, there are so many places throughout the world where things are in a, a state that is beyond our understanding possibly beyond our imagination Lord again we can only ask your blessing upon the people in, involved in such conflicts and suffering in such ways Lord bless them and keep them Lord coming back home we know that there are lots of things going on in this country and again we need your blessing upon our leaders you tell us to pray for those in leadership over us, and we do that, Lord. We pray that your will will infect all that they say and do, that your people will stand up for the things of yourself, be it in Parliament or any other form of government that they're involved in. Lord, let them be bold and confident to speak out the name of Jesus and to speak out your will in such circumstances lord we thank you for those gathered here today we thank you for the family that we are part of here we know that we're part of a worldwide family of those who seek to follow uh, the name of jesus and lord we thank you for that but for those in our midst who are suffering we ask your blessing lord we ask particularly thank you that Wendy is with us we ask your blessing upon her Lord she's facing worries of obviously concerns for what is to come for things that have been diagnosed for the treatment that she is to face Lord bless her and keep her give her some peace in her mind because she is in your hands Lord you are the enabler we know that you enable those who care for us we pray for doctors and nurses and we thank you for their dedication and their expertise. But we pray especially for Wendy in these coming days. Lord, we know that there are others in our midst who need your healing hand upon them. And we pray that you will reach out and touch them, that you will bless them, bless them as no one else can. Give to them the peace which we so often say passes all understanding because it is a peace that those who do not know you cannot fathom that there is peace in all sorts of circumstances 
if we acknowledge you as Lord and as Saviour. Lord, for other things in this country, we just ask that you will intervene through your people where that is possible. We pray for the parents of that young lad whose uh, life passed yesterday as, as he passed away when the uh, tubes, etc., were removed. The lad Archie and his family are going through such anguish. And Lord, we know that he is not alone and those families are not alone. There are others in anguish and devastated. And we, lo we know, Lord, that they probably cannot be comforted except through the name of Jesus. Lord, bless us. Bless them. Help us to do what you would have us do in circumstances where we find the opportunity to do it. In Jesus' name, we offer you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to just have a reading, and then Sylvia's just going to, uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll sing again, and then Sylvia's going to come and speak to us for a few minutes. But firstly, we're going to read uh, two portions from Romans. Romans chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 to 5, and then Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Have you told us that the grace of God covers the sins before and after? He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. That's a promise uh, that he makes and Paul records. And then in chapter 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he, he condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. And that's us, everybody. That's us. Let's sing once more. And we're going to sing that the Jesus who has redeemed us, who died, who rose from the dead. Jesus. All for Jesus. We'll sing that together.
<laughs> it was just a sum up so the children didn't need to go out. Um, sorry. It was just literally a sum up from Dave's, um, what Dave was talking about. So freedom from sin's grasp, I've kind of thought of. Saint Augustine wrote that God was the master whom to serve is perfect freedom. Augustine wrote that God was the master whom to serve is perfect freedom. And that's a paradox. Because many people think that if they serve God, they will lose all their freedom. In fact, as many here will know, it's the very opposite. Living for ourselves is, in fact, a form of slavery. Serving God in the new way of the spirit, which is what Romans 7 says in verse 6, is the way to find perfect freedom, free to have a relationship with him and to be the kind of person that deep down you long to be. On the final night of youth club with Jason leading, we had a water fight. It wasn't a particularly warm night, as I recall, but I had a change of clothing with me, so I joined in. I was soon soaked. I think it was Jason who tipped a bucket of water over me. And therefore, I aimed a shot with my water pistol to the nape of an exposed neck in front of me. The 12-year-old boy, the owner of the neck, yelled, spun round, and got me full in the face with his water pistol with water dripping down my glasses then said as if in thought I can't believe I just did that I squirted an old lady in the face with my water pistol <laughs> then off he went to have a go at someone else I have to admit that in the general fun with the water dripping from my glasses I had completely forgotten that I was actually an old lady Afterwards, I thought again and wondered, how did he know that it was probably an unusually wrong to squirt an old lady in the face with a water pistol? Because, of course, in this case, it was a game, and I had invited it by getting him first. But it's not something we would normally instruct our children, is it? Eat your vegetables, don't put your fingers into electricity sockets, look both ways before crossing the road, oh, and don't squirt old ladies in the face with water pillars. Pistols. We don't say that, do we? So somehow it must have been instinctive for him. And yet not a law and not a rule. And it gave me cause for thought on the rights and wrongs of what we think of as civilized behavior in this age. So I suppose there must be some things that we just automatically know that are unacceptable normally. Years ago, David had to defend many people on road traffic offences. Not that he didn't get into trouble himself a few times for speeding, as I recall. On one occasion, he had spent an entire day in court prosecuting for the police on driving offences, only to be caught himself later that night driving for 100 miles in exactly one hour. A bit naughty, wasn't it? Anyhow, one day he received a case which concerned Pam Rhodes of Stongs of Praise fame. You'll remember her. She had been accused of speeding down the A1. Now, I'm sure that being a good Christian and having such a good defence lawyer on hand, she was well taken care of. But even the best of us can break the law. Or would we call that a sin? None of us is perfect. But isn't it good to know that we do have the perfect defense lawyer sitting at God's right hand, really ready on our behalf to spring into action if and when we happen to need it? David read bits of Romans, chapter 6 and 8. I hoped he was going to read it in the message. He didn't, actually. And uh, it was my fault. I should have made that clear. Because it's a modern translation of our Bibles. And I, have, and I wanted it read in that particular passage because, for that, because it's very difficult, isn't it, to understand that. And I think it's a bit simpler the way it's put in the message. But um, anyhow, in our daily Bible readings for July, as David said, we've, been look, we've also been looking at Romans as well as the other thing. And um, we've had a very, very good person guiding us, i.e. Nikki Gumbel 
do from Alpha fame. And Paul's message has really come alive to us. And this is just one example. He says, there is Thomas the Tank Engine cartoon that shows Thomas on his side. Do we all know about Thomas the Tank Engine? Yeah. Thomas, having fallen off the train tracks, he is shouting, I'm free! I'm free at last! I've fallen off the tracks and I am free at last! Of course, the reality is that Thomas is far more free when his wheels are actually on the rails. And he is operating in line with how he has been created to function. And it is the same with us. We might imagine that we are freer if we have no one telling us what to do ourselves, other than ourselves. But it's a delusion. For we can so easily find ourselves enslaved to sin, which of course will lead to a terrible dead end. It has been said that the only excuse some people take is jumping to the wrong conclusions. Oh, that the only exercise some people take is jumping to the wrong conclusions. We knows as well as me. The assurance, <laughs> the assurance of forgiveness is not an excuse to go on sinning. Grace is not a casual get out clause for sin. Because as a Christian, we now serve God. One whose commands set us free to live openly within his freedom. Verse 23 of Romans 6 says, For God's gift is perfect freedom, real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. Or, as it says in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. When we are tempted, remember that we do not have to give in. We are no longer a slave to sin. We are free to say no. As for the law, the law code itself is God's good and common sense. Each commands sane and holy counsel. And it says that in verse 12 of Romans 7. We know that God's law is holy, righteous and good. Nicky Gumbel goes on to say, As I look at myself as a Christian empowered by the Spirit, I realize that I am free to overcome sin. To paraphrase John Newton, I am not what I want to be. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what one day I will be. But by the grace of God, I am not what I once was. Although the law was good, it was powerless to save us because of our sinful nature. So God sent Jesus to die for us as a sin offering. That was verse 3b. Jesus took away all our sins, past, present, and future. The Holy Spirit leads us to stop setting our mind on what that sinful nature desires, but rather to set our minds on what the Spirit desires. And this leads to life and peace and all that is possible because right now the Spirit of God lives in us. And of course, we can look forward to the resurrection of our body because the same Holy Spirit who lived in Jesus and raised him from the dead dwells in us. Therefore, Paul says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. It is those who receive Jesus to those who believe in his name that he gives the right to become children of God. If the letter to the Romans is the Himalayas of the New Testament, then Romans 8 is its Mount Everest. There is no higher status than to be a child of God. Under Roman law, if an adult wanted an heir, he could either choose one of his own sons or adopt a son who would take his name. God has only one begotten son, Jesus, but he has many adopted sons and daughters. We have been adopted into God's family, and there is no status in the world that compares with the privilege of being a child of the Creator of the universe, 
as children of God, we are heirs. The only difference is that we inherit not on the death of our father, but on our own death. We are going to enjoy an eternity of love with Jesus. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. as we've come to the end shall we finally sing our final hymn which is seeking God's guidance again guide me O thou great Jehovah so we'll sing this together as we come to the end <clears throat> bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. As you know, coffee will be served outside today, so uh, please stay and enjoy that time and enjoy the time together. <laughs>